Good evening, everybody, and welcome to tonight's Pinot Noir Masterclass with me, Matthew Horsley, I'm one of the buyers at the Wine Society. I look after England, Greece, and Hungary. And so Pinot Noir does kind of fall in my remit, although we won't be tasting any Pinot Noirs from England or Hungary today. We've got far more exciting things going on. Um, we've got Mahesh in the background, who's making sure nothing goes too badly wrong. Um, but do please make use of the chat function. Uh, make sure you send Q&As to everybody so everybody can see your questions. Um, Mahesh will do his best to answer anything easy to answer in the in the comments straight away uh, but he will ask me uh, if possible during the event uh, a bit like we did last week with our Botrytis masterclass you get me two weeks in a row which is very exciting and I believe quite a few of you have got the tasting packs as well which came with this tasting you will be sent an email after this event where you get offered I believe some money off 20% might be 10% I think actually um I think 72 hours you will get 10% off the wines in today's tasting I believe one of them has sold out since we listed it as one of the wines we're tasting so apologies about that I believe that's the Newton Johnson Hemelinada but I believe the others are still available on the website so do make use of that if you do enjoy any of the wines um, I'll go through the wines, I'll taste them with you, I'll give you a kind of a couple of minutes each time uh, just so that you can taste them because sometimes it's quite nice to, to kind of make your own opinions of the wines before the presenter presenter kind of fills you with their, <laughs> their thoughts and so uh, I'll try and remember to, to give you all a few minutes. Uh, for those that aren't tasting, um, apologies, I will go through what I believe the wine tastes like uh, to try and give you a, a good idea of, of of what we're tasting as much as possible. So uh, why are we doing this tasting? Well, there's a couple of slightly selfish reasons, but the, the main reason really is that I love Pinot Noir. I think it's the greatest grape variety there is, certainly the greatest red grape. Um, don't at me on that. I, I think it's absolutely true. Uh, it's responsible for some of the world's greatest wines, certainly some of the world's most expensive wines. And I wanted to do this tasting because we were looking to do masterclasses and with Burgundy the way it's going at the moment, um, I mean, prices of Burgundy are, are skyrocketing. The prices are up 25 or 22 percent, I think, for 2022 vintage. They were up 21 percent before that. The average price of Grand Cru wines from 2022 went up 50 percent uh, with the top increase being La Chaux, which went up nearly 500% in a year. Uh, and I'm not saying that Burgundy, you know, it's all like that. There is still great value to be had in Burgundy, I believe. But for us mere mortals, things are becoming harder and harder to, to get hold of. And so I thought it'd be really interesting to do a tasting of some wines from outside Burgundy, which I thought would be interesting to perhaps compare and compete against. Uh, but also for totally selfish reasons, uh, I'm sitting the Master of Wine exam in a few weeks' time. And so this is a really nice way of getting Pinot Noirs from around the world for me to kind of taste so that I'm prepared in case they come up. Uh, so that's my entirely selfish reason. Right, let's start a, a little presentation, shall we? Hopefully that's the right page. Uh, hopefully you can all see that and it should be presentation view. Um, so in terms of Burgundy, um, Pinot Noir, we're not talking about Burgundy, sorry, I'm already talking about Burgundy. Uh, Pinot Noir as a whole, hopefully you all have an idea of what uh, Pinot Noir is like. Uh, it's a fairly light grape variety in terms of colour, body, alcohol. Uh, it's pretty fresh and tannin. It's fairly marginal. And so I think there's some sort of stat where you know, most of the or all of the premium growing areas for Pinot Noir across the world are within like 1.2 or 1.5 degrees um, average temperature. So it's very, very marginal. It's becoming increasingly hard to grow high quality Pinot Noir with people looking to either go higher in altitude or changing their grape growing practices or work in the winery to maintain freshness and keep those lovely, elegant, perfumed styles of Pinot Noir that we really like. In terms of flavours, 
you're looking at your your red current, your red fruit spectrum. With age, they get forest floor and umami and mushroom. Uh, but a lot of these wines that we're tasting today are, are still fairly youthful. Even the wine at the end, which is 2017, having just smelt it, is still pretty youthful. And so there's lots of those crushed strawberry notes, red cherries, Coca-Cola spices. I get a lot in Pinot Noir. Um, and hopefully we should see quite a lot of different methods of producing Pinot Noir as well over this spectrum. Typically, it's fairly lightly handled in the winery, not much extraction that you'd expect with a variety like Cabernet or Shiraz, where it's all about power and tannin and ageability. Whereas Pinot Noir's ageability really comes from its balance, I think. When you've got a lovely balance of alcohol, acid, fruit weight, body, tannin, wines tend to age really well. When one of those elements is, is out of kilter, typically that's going to be the lasting impression after four, five, six years. And so typically the wines that are in balance in their youth will remain balanced in their maturity. Um, so that's kind of a, a very quick overview on Pinot Noir. I'm conscious that we don't have ginormous amounts of time. We're supposed to be doing an hour and 15. I'm going to try and keep it to around an hour so we have got time for questions at the end. Um, so without further ado, let's go on to the first wine. So I thought I'd choose uh, a Pinot Noir from fairly close to home and uh, just over the border in Germany. Fairly similar climate to Burgundy, uh, pretty continental, so pretty warm during the summer, very, very cold during the winter, um, and has that typical old world savoury style, I hope. Uh, this wine is from Stodden, uh, it's a 2019 vintage. Uh, it's from the R Valley, which is just south of Bonn, which is not too far from Cologne. And you probably saw if if you're followers of wine or read any wine magazines or to be honest even world news there was a pretty horrific flood uh, in the R Valley back in 2021 um, I mean over 200 deaths I believe which is just appalling and a lot of wineries were were pretty ruined uh, I'm not too sure how Stodden fared, but I know that their cellars were certainly disrupted. I know that there's another one of their wines on sale on our website at the moment, I believe, which was one of those salvaged wines from the flood. Um, but uh, yeah, it ripped through the the R Valley in kind of mid-July. Um, so just before you're getting into key ripening times, which is fairly disastrous. And so the pictures just look awful. Um, but in terms of this estate, uh, it's a pretty old estate. It's found, founded in 1578, I believe, and it focuses on quite structured Pinot Noir. Um, do taste, if, if you haven't done so already, then hopefully you can get an impression of the wine before I start talking about it. Uh, and the, the key thing really in, in the R Valley is the, is the super steep slopes. I mean, this is, I believe, one of, if not the most northerly, wine growing regions in Germany so you'd expect it to be fairly cold and so you're really looking for sites which soak up as much sunshine as possible and so with those super steep slopes you're getting far greater sun exposure there's far less shading from the other vines to the side and in front of them and so you're really maximizing the amount of sun that you're getting and also super importantly typically in non-flood years those steep slopes help drainage, not just water drainage from excessive rain, which there is a lot of in northern Germany, but also air. So there's frost, um, really cold air will clump um, together, and that's what's going to cause frost. And so when you've got nice steep slopes, it helps filter the cool air away to reduce frost risk, which is, is super important. In terms of wine making for this wine, uh, it's... Yeah, so it's predominantly from south and southeast facing slopes. The soil here is sand and loam with quite a lot of stone, quite a lot of slate. So really good drainage, helps reflect the sun really nicely. So really absorbs all that heat and expels it during the night to help mature the grapes. Uh, it spends 14 days on the skins macerating prior to fermentation and malolactic in 1,000-year-old 
1,000 year old, 1,000 litre old oak casks. So this is it's probably why I put it at the start of the tasting because a it's probably the more savoury expression of Pinot Noir, but also it's probably the one that's least influenced by oak. See, the larger the oak vessel, the less connection there is with the wine, and so less impact. And also, the older the the older the cask, uh, the less flavour that you're imparting from the oak. But also, as oak barrels are used and used and used there's often a, a buildup of tartrate crystals etc within the lining of the barrel which means that their oxygen ingress is decreased and so with new barrels those pores in the staves aren't clogged up and so there's typically far more oxygen ingress which has even bigger development on the, on the wine whereas this it's it's more about slowly softening tannins and slow flavor development rather than flavor addition from over new oak let's have a tasty taste i've chatted enough um in terms of color it's kind of a slightly ruddy ruby um there's not really much sign of evolution but it's fairly fairly pale as you'd expect from pinot noir it looks it looks pretty inviting very bright um in terms of smell there's definitely kind of a spicy cherry note. There's definitely a Greeky, savory uh, character to the wine and a slightly smoky nature as well. I wasn't too sure. I couldn't find any information on the whole bunch, but certainly the trend over the last 10, 15 years has been fermentation using whole clusters, uh, which includes the stems. And often that gives a slightly coca-cola spice note to the wine uh, it also slightly adjusts the the ph but not to a ginormous amount um, but i do get that slightly cooked spice which is really nice i have a spittoon this week so i'm not just spitting on the floor off camera i do have a spittoon the acidity is kind of what you'd expect from a pretty cool viticultural area. It's it's pretty bright, very brisk acidity. It definitely is part of what defines the wine. The tannins are super fine. They're quite grippy. Pinot Noir, for quality Pinot Noir anyway, I was tasting with Toby, our Burgundy buyer, a lot today. And I was asking him about, you know, what's what for you is the, the signal for quality when you're tasting Pinot Noir and for him a massive part of it is the quality of those tannins when you're looking at Grand Cru sites in Burgundy they if the tannins aren't super sweet and really well integrated whilst providing structure then it's, it's not ideal and this has got really good structure and grip uh, the, the tannins are quite spicy as well the body's pretty pretty light pretty medium uh, but you get loads of that lovely dark cherry cranberry um almost cherry kernel notes which is which is really rather moorish um in terms of serving for these wines i had these wines in the fridge for about 45 minutes to an hour before i poured them into my glass some there was quite an interesting rule i heard the other day which i which i would probably go for which is a, a 2020 rule so taking your whites out of the fridge 20 minutes before you drink them and putting your reds in the fridge 20 minutes before you drink them which i think would work pretty well certainly with pinot noir toby says that pinot around 16 degrees i know it's not ideal because a lot of fridges don't necessarily have uh, temperature gauges which which you can change to 16 but if you've got a wine fridge then around 16 degrees is ideal for, for pinot noir and and he typically says don't decant because pinot noir so much of the joy is in the aromas and if you start decanting them then sometimes you can lose some of those volatile aromas which which are really rather charming and after you've lost those then sometimes the, the structure can just be a little bit more obvious but that's the wine here's a picture of the Arbalie. valley where the where this is in the Arbalie, valley i don't quite know but it gives you an idea of some of the super steep slopes uh it's absolutely gorgeous uh, I'm I love Germany and I'm desperate to go traveling around Germany more um, but it, it gives you an idea of, of some of the steepness of the slopes um, so yeah it's really rather pretty
Right. I think we'll move on. So we're heading now into uh, well, outside of Europe. The next wine we've got is, is actually a brand new wine that we only released a matter of months ago. And it's our exhibition Saint Julien Pinot Noir from 2021. And this is made for us by Marcello Papa, who's one of the winemakers at Contrary Toro, who are, you know, legendary in, in South America for producing a wide range of everything from fairly entry level but delicious wines to, to pretty super premium. And and Toby's been highlighting the Limery Valley for a number of years now. Chile's quite unique in that, albeit being the one of the longest countries in the world in terms of north to south, and typically you look at temperature changing north to south, actually east to west is 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 super essential with, with Chile, as we'll see in this next picture. This is kind of zoomed in, uh, obviously, of, of the Limery Valley. I'll try and get my little pointer out. I don't know where it is. Oh, is that it down there? I don't know what that is. Laser pointer. Here we go. Oh, there we are. So, yeah, this is the Limery Valley uh, heading, uh, well, technically it heads east to west into the Pacific Ocean. And San Julian is, is right in the middle here. So, this whole area is, is really the, the Limery Valley area. Uh, and the key part for a lot of Chile is this mountain range, which blocks off quite a lot of the, the wind, the the intense coolness uh, from the Pacific, because the Pacific's a pretty cold ocean, but it does help suck up cool air uh, up through the, the valley. And so the Limery, despite being, I mean, we're, we're considerably far north from Santiago, the capital here, so we're further up towards the equator, but it helps cool the area beautifully. And... There's lots of limestone in the soil around Limery, which helps produce really elegant, quite mineral, uh, quite floral styles of, of Pinot Noir. Uh, and this is a, a wine made exclusively for us, which Toby, I believe, blended alongside Marcello when he was out there a few years ago. And I think it's, it's a really gorgeous style of Pinot Noir. Sometimes Chilean Pinot can, can taste sometimes quite herbaceous. A little bit green but there is absolutely no for me um let me take i know there was a comment last week that i didn't take the camera off very often so i'm going to stop sharing that uh so it could be sometimes quite green whereas i don't get any green pyrazini notes on this at all it's it's really juicy strawberry crushed strawberry Cherry skin. I'm going to say cherry a lot in this tasting. <laughs> but for me, Pinot Noir smells like smells like cherries, uh, but it's noticeably riper than the the German wine, I believe. For me, um, I'm not too sure how the alcohol compares. I know that maybe on in the uh, alcohol 12.5. Yeah, so this is a degree more than the 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 German. The German was 12.5, which is you know pretty standard for for cool climate Pinot. This is 13.5, so still not high. 13.5 is, is probably pretty standard for Pinot. But it's super bright. There's there's maybe a little bit of reduction on mine, that kind of gun flinty, smoky, savory note, but I think that adds some nice complexity. If it's if it's a bit too reductive for you, give it a good swish, give it a good swirl, and I'm sure it'll blow off. Hmm. So it tastes. The palate is is definitely fuller. You get a bit more alcohol lift. The tannins are maybe a bit bigger, a bit chewier, but but riper. And you get more kind of body on the mid palate. You're not getting those savory characters that you're getting with 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 the German Pinot. It's super pure. There's a little bit of herbaceous notes on the palate. That might be from some whole bunch, uh, but it also is. It can be a bit of a giveaway sometimes for, for chili, certainly with 
with Cabernet and Carmenere or Malbec, they often have that herbaceous pyrazine character. But this is super plush, it's super classy. In terms of oak use, I'm just trying to see. I know it was back on the table note pack, which was sent out. Uh, so this is is made using a French clone called Triple Seven, which is used a lot in the UK at the moment for still Pinot Noir because it's, it's pretty early ripening. So it's ideal in cool climates and it makes quite small berries. And so you're getting quite a lot of flavor quite a lot of concentration and then um, quite a lot of, of body, which, which is essential for cool climate Pinot. Uh, of course, if anyone's got any questions about the wines, if I'm rattling through them a bit too quickly, please, please shout, because uh, I, I will happily you know, answer any questions that you need. Um, in terms of wine making, uh, I'll talk about the soil first. Of course, we've got to talk about soil because it's Pinot Noir. Um, there is limestone, but it's mainly clay here. So clay typically gives broader, bigger styles of Pinot Noir. A lot of Burgundy, a lot of the Grand Cru sites for Pinot, um, they're often on clay. Um, takes Well, often they're a mixture of clay and limestone, because so you want to get that balance. But clay, heavier, takes longer to warm up, greater water um, pickup. So you typically get much bolder, much bigger stars of wine. And so in riper years, they, they, they ripen really beautifully. In cold years, they can be a little bit tart and tannic and austere. But in limestone typically gives much fresher, much uh, much more elegant stars of wine. So a lot of Vaume uh, Romane, Chambol will be a little bit more limestone, a bit more aromatic. So this is predominantly clay uh, and with some limestone. 25% whole bunch. So that's why I mentioned we get a little bit of um, uh, spicy, herbaceous notes, but it gives lovely freshness and elegance. And 11 months in French oak, I believe two to eight litre, which is typically, which is burgundy sized barrels and 12% new oak. So we're starting to see a little bit of new oak here, which often just gives for me just a little bit more opulent oak character, a little bit more of that nutmeg, a little bit more cinnamon, sometimes a bit of vanilla, sometimes a bit of coconut. Typically coconut is a little bit more American oak, which you don't see much on Pinot Noir outside of the USA, but it's bigger, richer, chunkier, but still super elegant. And so I thought it would work quite nicely in, in the number two slot behind the German. Let me know what you think. I think it's delicious. Might have done quite well in a in a blind tasting that we do every year with the bias. Just seeing if there's any comments. Yeah. Yeah, there, the Peter Cousins, definitely there's some more black fruit. I think definitely a dark, dark cherry. Okay, cool. Let's try and share my screen again without blowing the computer up. There we go. Right, let's try and get rid of this pointer. Does that work? Good. Next one. So now we're going to South Africa. So staying in the Southern Hemisphere. And this is a winery called Newton Johnson. We're going to Hemelanada, which, uh, which I'll show you on a map again. For anyone who's watched any of my tastings before, I love Google Earth. It's the best way to learn about wine because everything makes sense because you can see it. So when you talk about cooling influences or mountains or slopes, or whatever, you know, it's 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 a great way to, to highlight terroir. This is the wine, unfortunately, that sold out. Uh, I imagine that we'll be getting the new vintage in at some point, but I haven't had a chance to ask Joe, who is a South Africa buyer. And so let's move on because that's not a very interesting slide. Cool. Oh, here we are. This is South Africa. So if you can imagine, let me get my pointer out again. Cape Town's up here. Uh, Table Mountain is kind of just off screen above there. Uh, we've got False Bay here. I was lucky enough to go out to South Africa with Joe just before Christmas for Cape Wine. And we did an amazing car trip around Table Mountain. And you kind of come around here and down into False Bay and then come around here, Pringle Bay, and it is 
just breathtakingly incredible. I cannot recommend it highly enough. Um, and then we continued on down to, well, actually, we actually went up around this way. Um, but Hanalanada is the valley just here. I've got a, no, I don't actually zoom in at all. Um, but I've got a lovely picture that I took from Newton Johnson back in October, which I'll show next. But yeah, this is the this is the valley. So going up from Hermanus. And it's it's a valley that's separated into three three main bits. Uh, so you've got Hemelanada Valley here, upper Hemelanada, which is where this wine is from, and then you've got Hemelanada Ridge at the top, typically getting cooler as you go up. And it's a it's a super trendy area, especially for cooler climate varietals like Pinot Noir and Chardonnay, but also there's you know some really top quality Chenin Blanc producers here. So this is where Chris Alhite is, who has this fantastic cartology, which is you know, taken from around the Western Cape. So it's not necessarily Chenin from uh, Hemelanada, but it's it's a very cool, for want of a better word, area at the moment. And for me, it's making some of South Africa's greatest wines, no doubt. Uh, and again, it's, it's a gorgeous drive. Um, I'll show you from my picture. This is from Newton Johnson. Um, so this looks down kind of southwest towards the ocean down over here. And so we're kind of looking north up this way. And so a lot of the vineyards on this side uh, are north facing. And so they get a little bit more sun over here. They're south, southwesty facing, southeast. And so they get a little bit more shade. Um, but it's just a it's a really stunning place and it's packed full of top names. So I think Bouchard Finlayson are just here, Hamilton Russell are just down the way, a little bit around the corner, Chris Alhite, I've already mentioned, uh, Seven Springs are just over there, uh, Ataraxia. There's some really exciting producers in, in Hemelanada. In terms of the style, I find let me stop sharing. Hemelanada is typically super pure, very cool climate, fruit, lovely fresh acidity, really crunchy red fruit, cranberry, crushed strawberries, um, and just lovely perfume, elegant winemaking is typically quite a lot of whole bunch, not too much oak, a little bit of new oak often, but there should be lovely concentration there should be really nice grippy tannins and as all great pinot should have it should have a lovely aroma yeah mm. this to me i'm trying to think whether there is any whole bunch to me it smells like there is uh in terms of the soils in heaven and Arda, Lots of granite, decomposed granite, very iron rich clay, which can give quite a ferrous style. So think of pomade and volnay. Rougienne in pomade is ruddy. And so that they, they say that's got quite a uh, an irony, ferrous character to it. This isn't too far off. The tannins maybe aren't quite as gruff. The tannins are slightly sweeter and smoother here, but there's definitely that. Rusty nail is probably a horrible tasting note, but it, it can often have a slight rusty nail character. Uh, I find that the wines of Pinots from Oregon can often have that sort of metallic, in a good way, ferrous nature. And grapes here are chilled overnight, so they bring the grapes in whole bunch. They chill them to about eight degrees overnight to retain freshness. Then they distem them into stainless steel fermentation with no sulfur additions, six to seven days cold maceration, spontaneous yeasts, pigeage, so punching down, pumping over for fairly gentle extraction, just to get a little bit of colour, a little bit of tannin, a little bit of structure. And then it spends 25 days on the skins before they press. Um, and... Uh, yeah, then spends 11 months in two to eight litre burgundy barrels with 28% new oak. So we're popping up the, the new oak spectrum a little bit here. Um, yeah, I find this, it's quite, despite all the cool, crunchy red fruit, 
um, almost cherry kernel character. It's it's quite an opulent wine. It it jumps out of the glass. Um, I don't know if you can see, but it's it's noticeably a lot paler than the Chilean. Chilean is almost purple in the glass, and this one's that looks exactly the same. <laughs> but in in real life, it doesn't. There's a, there's a little bit of kind of bricking here, uh, not because it's old. I guess it's probably just had a bit more oxygen during winemaking, and maybe a little bit more gentle pressing. Just some of the skins. Who knows? I really like it. Uh, this is at 13.5% as well, so the same as the Chilean. And so yeah, it's a nice herbal, fresh, enlivening style of Pinot. Great. What do people like it? I did see one not, not so positive comment pop up, but that's fine. Like alcoholic fruit juice, fine. I, I think that's quite a good thing. <laughs> But uh, yeah, I think it will gain some complexity over time as well. I think all of these wines, every wine that we're tasting today will will improve. A lot of them are quite primary. So I think you will get some more savoury forest floor umami notes. But I, I think they're all rather charming at the moment. So good. Again, let me try and reshare my screen without blowing the computer up. Cool. Oh. Oh, there we go. Right. Uh, well, these reviews aren't very good for the, wine. <laughs> for the wines. Don't listen to them. Listen to me. Uh, so this is a, a brand new wine to our range. I was speaking to Freddie Bayer for Australia today, and we actually tasted this wine in the office with Pierre, head of buying, and we were all singing the praises of 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 Peter Dredge, who's the winemaker, uh, who's kind of brand name is Dr. Edge, who is very much one of Australia's trendy winemakers at the moment, and everybody's desperate to get hold of his wines. And so it was a bit of a coup that we managed to grab a parcel of not only his Pinot Noir, but also his Chardonnay. This is from Tasmania. So obviously the little island off the island of Australia. And Tassie Pinot, you know, this is this is super cool climate. Pinot, and so the wines should be lighter in colour, higher in acidity, um, very grippy, grainy tannins, and in terms of Australian Pinot winemaking as a whole, my giveaway often is a lot more reduction, a lot more whole bunch, and so that very smoky, spicy aroma, often very pale in colour, which is often what you get when you uh, use whole bunches, is that slightly paler, brighter colour. But it's you know, trying to pick between a Tassie and a Mornington Peninsula Pinot, for example. I have no idea how you'd manage to do that without just lucking it out. But style-wise, pretty similar. In terms of where he gets the grapes from, I believe his winery is based in Hobart, which is a capital down in the south, but he sources his grapes from two different vineyard areas. So he's majority from the Derwent Valley, which is this kind of shoot going up here from Hobart. And then the other section is from Tamar Ridge, which is this area here coming from south to north up that way. And Look, they're pretty different areas, and so down here is predominantly sandstone. It's an extremely cool area. I mean, not only is it the south side of Tasmania, but also a lot of it is probably fairly south-facing, and so you're basically down at the Antarctica. I hope it's Antarctica down there, isn't it? Yeah. Um, so super cool, very fresh, very crunchy, long growing season, and then up here it's more clay. So a little bit warmer, some volcanic soils up here. And um, so that's where probably a lot of the body and richness and weight is coming from the wine. Oh, it's just such a cool map, isn't it? It looks amazing. And wine making. Here, let me take my screen off again. So you can all see my beautiful face. Um, 
it's like it's this is super bright and purple in the glass i mean it's what vintage is it it's 2022 so this is you know straight out of tank basically so it's got that lovely vivid purple in the glass it's only 12.5 percent as well which is great obviously cool climate um less sugar to turn into to alcohol in terms of wine making i've already mentioned they're from two different areas he does lots of micro ferments so between four to six different ferments uh, with an average of 40 percent whole bunch so that whole bunch percentage is going up here again like i mentioned it's quite trendy in australia to have lots of whole bunch uh, definitely getting lots of that stemmy sappy stalky spicy character which is lovely it can also be in so long as you've got a ripe vintage it could be quite a nice way of softening the acidity a little bit because the stems have potassium in them. Potassium is alkaline. And so if you're fermenting a whole bunch, it can change the pH by 0.2, 0.3, which every little helps, I suppose. And then the rest is whole berry with no crushing, soaks with spontaneous fermentation for three to four days. And he puts whole clusters on top of the, the destemmed berries and he doesn't do any pigeage so no punch downs no punch overs for the first 10 days apparently so those whole clusters at the bottom uh, they go through carbonic maceration i would assume semi-carbonic rather than full carbonic uh, and then after they go through carbonic for three or four days he's then punching down a lot to get all of that extraction and a little bit more structure and a little bit more spice and weight and power into the wine and then presses sorry there's a bug or a fly and then presses into stainless steel open top fermenters um, spontaneous fermentation 28 degrees top and so higher temperatures you're, you're blowing off some of the, the the lighter aromas you're getting some more savory spices um, then he's pressing them into french oak barrels again i assume burgundy barrels two to eight liter and then actually it says bariques here so two two fives that makes that much difference um so two two five bariques third and fifth use third two fifth use so no new oak here um and also he's maintaining the leaves in the barrel as well which can aid that reductive mucky ferments with with greater leaves presence because leaves are reductive they give that reductive character this is filtered but unfined apparently i think this is a wine that it's it's a little bit uh i, I believe it or not I've, I've just seen a comment a comment saying it's it's quite young to judge it's exactly what i was about to say it's a little bit it's a little bit primary at the moment it's a little bit um yeah it's a little bit quiet and lots of fruit but I think that, that there's serious class underneath it. On that one, Matt, we had a couple of comments on it. We've got Damien saying, is this giving a Beaujolais bubblegum taste? Uh, John said, John picked up the carbonic maceration. Yeah. Um, Richard has said he gets a touch of banana. And then Svetlana is saying, a beautiful wine. I would love to try this in 2030. I totally, yeah, I agree. And I, I, I agree with a lot of those comments. I think I do get, I definitely get some, some uh, Beaujolais-y, bubblegummy, carbonic maceration flavours. I think it's, I think it's quite nice. I think it adds some personality. Banana is, is often kind of an estery, um, coolish ferment um, aroma, which will dissipate with age. Uh, and a little bit of oxygen as well because it's quite a volatile aroma and so if you find it then if you don't like it give it a good swish around but really i totally agree that this probably needs a couple more years um i've this is the first time well early today was the first time i tried this wine i heard a lot about his wines and i was very keen to try it and so this is a good opportunity to do so without without buying a bottle if i'm perfectly honest um but I think there's lots of lots of charm there. But it's kind of it's kind of purple fruits. Um, with with cherry, of course, and crushed strawberries. It's kind of like a shambol style. Very elegant. 
I'm not saying it's Rubier Les Amoureux, but you know, who knows? <laughs> Thankfully, it doesn't cost quite that much. Oh, that's, that's really nice. I really like that. But I like that quite stripped back, restrained, floral, elegant style of Pinot. But I agree, a couple more years and it'll be super duper. Back to Google Maps. Come on. Here we go. There we go. Okay, from Australia to New Zealand. Let me take off my laser pointer. So now we're going to central Otago, which is pretty much slap bang in the centre of the South Island, not too far from Queenstown. And this is from Prophets Rock, who we've been working with for quite a while. Um, head winemaker Paul Pujol is, is a big wine society fan. We love him to bits. He's a lovely guy. He makes cracking wine. And central Otago is... It's it's an area of super premium, really delicious Pinot Noir. I find that typically the wines are, are quite plush, quite ripe. I know that, let me go to the map. I know a lot of people go on about, oh, it's so cool and cool climate in Central Otago. I don't agree with that really at all. It's, it's, it's pretty warm. It's got pretty long... Uh, growing days, I think the average temperature during peak season is about 21 degrees C, which is which is which is pretty high. Uh, but most importantly, it's got loads of sunshine hours, and so the important bit really is is photosynthesis, isn't it? When it comes to ripening grapes, and so there's lots of sunshine, lots of photosynthesis, and so you typically get, for me, quite ripe, quite more on the darker fruit spectrum, going to Central Otago, my my often giveaway is kind of blueberry fruit for, for Central Otago and really rich, plush tannins. So where are we in Central Otago? Good question. Let me get my laser pen out. So we've got Queenstown here. We're kind of the valley over. Um, so you've got, here's Cromwell and where we want to be for the home vineyard is a place called Bendigo, which is just here. I think I've got a zoomed in one next up, um, which I'll go to in just a second. Yeah, there we are. Most of my notes are on this slide, though, so I'm going to keep it here. Um, so most of this area is former glacier, and so it's a super rich mix of soils from schist, quartz, clay. There's some chalk as well, apparently, which I didn't know. Uh, and we're talking fairly high altitude, 400 metres, so you do get a lot of that diurnal range, which is the warm temperatures during the day and then cool temperatures at night. So I mentioned that 21 degrees apparently is around the average temperature during the day. It's about 10 degrees at night. So the temperature does drop fairly considerably at night to help maintain lovely fresh acidity, which is essential. Um, this is us kind of zoomed in a bit. So you can see Cromwell there uh, and Bendigo is, is just up here. It just looks amazing. Um, I'm lucky I have been to New Zealand but a long time ago, uh, way before I was in the wine trade. And so I would desperate to go back and explore it from a wine point of view because it is just the most stunning country. Um, so, yeah, we're in Bendigo for the home vineyard. Um, right. But yeah, I mean, there's, it's noticeably more colour in this compared to certainly the Tazi um, and certainly the uh, Himlanada. Uh, for me, it smells a lot riper. It smells a lot plusher. It smells more kind of like, like blueberry sorbet, blueberry yogurt maybe uh, in a nice way, but it's definitely creamier. It's a little bit sweeter. While you're on that one, Matt, I've got a couple of quick questions for you. How high is Bendigo? How high is Bendigo? So supposedly 400 metres is where the this home vineyard is. Excellent, thank you. And then Richard's saying that, um, not jammy, rather assertive in a good way. Sure. Is, is this powdery tannins? So could you give us something on the tannins there, please? Oh, yeah, powdery tannins. Could this be powdery? Yeah. Yeah, powdery, chalky, 
I find them maybe a bit powdery. So I find them maybe a bit bit drying for powdery. That's why I kind of think chalky. This is so splitting hairs, isn't it? <laughs> um, I find chalky can sometimes leave a little bit of a drying aftertaste, and I find this the tannins on this are you're you're right in that they're powdery and chalky, in that they totally coat the palate. Um, and there's almost kind of no distinction. They're very tightly knit. Um, that's why we think kind of powdery, chalky. Um, but I find them just maybe a little bit drying. Um, there's lots of structure there. Um, I'm trying to think how I would describe the tannins in the other wines. I'll come back to those at the end if, if, if I can remember. I should have done a bit more of that, shouldn't I? Excellent. Considering I said how important tannins are with Pinot. <laughs> um, yeah, I'll come back. I'll come back to that at the end if that's okay. But do if you if you have a marker for the tannins that you think and all the other wines, you say, and then maybe I'll just go. Yeah, that sounds right. <laughs> um, I struggled to find any winemaking notes on this wine. I have to say, so I apologise. There's definitely oak. I think there's probably quite a small percentage of new oak, maybe ten to twenty percent. So I'm getting a little bit of kind of sweet cedar nutmeggy spice on kind of on the mid palate and perhaps some of those tannins are coming from oak as well i would guess again two to eight liter burgundy barrels but it's it's very elegant i know i mentioned there's tannins but it's super elegant this for me is is more kind of chevry chambertin sort of style lots of fruit great weight and power lovely structured tannins that really linger on the finish. Uh, and it's that lovely balance of weight, elegance, fruit, savory spice. It's you know, it's it's really very good. And you know, for 30 quid, I think I think it's I think it's really great value. Um, if you can ever call a wine at 30 quid great value, but I th I think it's really delicious and pretty long as well. Right, let's crack on to the final wine. Oh, people don't like New World Pinot. <laughs> um, we can all give lovely five star reviews after this. That will make Sarah the the uh, uh, I'll get my words out the uh, the USA buyer very happy. I'm sure. Um, so this is the oldest wine we've got in the flight. It's also most expensive. Um, so this is 2017, and definitely for those that've got it in the glass, there is definitely a kind of brick red note to the wine. And there is definitely more development on the nose. So this is from Sonoma. It's Hansel, who are one of the really historic wineries and vineyards of, of Sonoma. Let's show you where Sonoma is because it's been too long since I've had a map up. So Sonoma is, is here, just north of San Francisco, obviously on the west coast of the USA. And Sonoma Valley, which is where the grapes of this wine come in, which is an AVA, is literally runs parallel to, to Napa Valley, which runs up here. And this just gives you a, an idea. You've got the San Andreas Fault coming, coming down here, which is all very, very exciting. But most importantly for, for this area is, is, uh, is the cool air coming in through San Francisco Bay. Uh, and either up Napa or up Sonoma Valley, which helps keep the, the areas lovely and cool and that lovely morning fog that everybody knows about in Napa and Sonoma uh, that not only provides water um, and lovely replenishment, but also it blocks the sunlight as well. And so it, it really cools it on, on both terms. It lowers the temperature, but also blocks the sunlight as well. So it stops photosynthesis, which is super important we zoom in this gives you a better idea um so obviously you've got napa running up here and starting really oak knoll oakville up to rutherford san helena san, san helena up all the way up there and then you've got sonoma valley here um but sonoma valley as an ava is is fairly small uh, it's got i think three sub avas within it but then sonoma county is is a much larger kettle of fish with sonoma coast ava which is ginormous running pretty much all the way up um up towards 
Port Ross way up towards um, Mendocino County. So this is kind of a nice little snapshot. Um, because it's further inland, it's a little bit warmer than, than Sonoma Coast. We've got Sonoma Mountain here, I believe, which blocks in a lot of the, or blocks out a lot of the super cool air. And so it's, yeah, it's fairly moderate climate. Um, and I think this wine is absolutely stonkingly delicious at the moment. It's for me, it's in a really lovely place. I know there was a few comments on the community of people who had it recently saying it's still quite young. Absolutely right. It's still got way, way long to go. I can't. Oh, now it's 2029 and the notes that Sarah's given. And you know, she's pretty spot on with her tasting notes. I think that's absolutely fair. Um, and so I, I think this has definitely got time to go, but you're starting to get those mushroom, umami, soy notes that you often get with with aging pinot but lovely red currenty fruit underneath yeah peter said now you're talking this one has all the pinot noir character of balancing fruit with herby flavors and savory aftertaste beautiful is the words it's used it's bloody good yeah <laughs> Yeah, beautiful is, is the way of, of way of saying it. It's thirteen point five percent alcohol. You definitely get some some warmth on the on the back of the palate, but you know, this is this is Californian Pinot. What do you what do you expect? Um, it's got that richness. It's got that weight. I'm trying to see if I've got my yeah. So my wine making stuff here. So I've had to pop back. Uh, so it's an estate blend from. 12 acres across three different vineyard blocks in Sonoma Valley AVA. Ambassadors 1953, Debray and Sessions, apparently, not that not really is that essential. Average vine age is 30 years old, apparently, which you know, is, I suppose that's old. I work with Greece. I was in Santorini the other week and there's vines that are 220 years old, ungrafted. So when I hear 30 years, I'm like, okay. <laughs> but, you know, for Pinot from New World Country, that's pretty bloody good. Um, clay loam soils with some volcanic elements as well. And this is around 670 to 800 feet. So it's not ginormous altitude, but it's enough. And they use they have their own Hansel heritage clones as well. Clones of Pinot are, are super important. Um, there's so many different types, different strains. Some are working, some aren't. Rootstocks are obviously very important as well. A lot of Burgundy is grubbing up old rubbish rootstocks at the moment um, to replant with, with, with better rootstocks. But I won't go into that. Uh, this, this has 10 days cold soak. So, you know, moderate time having cold soak. Cold soak brings out lots of lovely aromas, often really nice florality which I think you do get on this wine. I know there's some savoury character, but there's lots of lovely damson -y aromas on the nose. 15% whole bunch, so adding that little bit of spice. 10 months and 35% new French oak with 65% neutral barrels. So I think this is the wine with the most new oak, but it's super well integrated. I don't think you'd, I don't think you'd think that. I suppose that you, you do get quite a lot on the nose. But it's it's super well integrated, and as it's French oak, it's it's elegant, it's nutty, it's spicy. Hmm. Yeah, tannins on this. Hmm. They're quite. There's not not many. They're they're well integrated, but what there are, I think they are quite chunky. They're they're few but chunky. They're far less fine than in the central Otago. A little bit, yeah, chunkier in a nice way. Uh, but I think I think it's super gorgeous, super gorgeous. Right, we've got we've got time left, don't we? Maybe I take some questions. Maybe I can go back and assess tannins in the, in the other wines. I've got a couple of things for you, Matthew. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. So so first of all, I put in the chat, I don't know whether you saw, I put in the chat about your award, Online Wine Buyer of the Year at the London Wine Fair. Oh, so thank you. You've I put that at the beginning of the chat. But I, I didn't think you'd noticed it, but um, a lot of members are congratulating you on that. 
Um, we have a lot of members wishing you good luck for your Master of Wine exam as well. Um, there's also a lot of members have added wines to their tasting tonight. So we've had people with the French Pinot Noir. We've had people with the Simpsons Rabbit Hole, which I think you bought, didn't you? 2018 yeah. vintage. That's Great. one of the ones you purchased for us, I believe. Uh, Saw Appetite as well. Lovely. Um, and that brings in a question from Kevin. What is your view of UK Pinot Noir? And as you're the English wine buyer, um, <laughs> I hope this is a good question for you. Kevin had a Danbury, a Danbury Bridge uh, 2018 from the Wine Society, which was excellent. Yeah. So if you want to talk about the English Pinot Noir a little bit, that'd be great. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. I, I think it's improving. I think there's some really good producers. Uh, Danbury Ridge, you mentioned, are definitely one of the very strong producers. Uh, I was at, I was at Danbury Ridge earlier this year, desperately trying to get an allocation because it is tiny quantities, uh, very little quantities, and quite rightly, their focus is very much on trade, which is fair enough. Um, I and because the wine, the 2018 that you've got there, was a wine that we bought through a charity project by Susie and Peter Richards, who are husband and wife master of wine team, and so we we sold that wine through them. Uh, to raise money for charity and it is really bloody good I mean 2018 as we all know was quite a warm year in the UK and when you get warm years like that in the right place their fruit comes from Essex which seems to be the hotbed for still Pinot in the UK at the moment it's the it is the exciting place it's the place to be for still Pinot Noir I believe and so there is huge potential there is a, a, a decent amount of not good Pinot um, but we are getting a lot better. The Simpsons um, Pinot, I think, is is very good. It's quite savoury. It's quite smoky. It's quite spicy. Uh, I find I find Danbury Ridge the Pinots there they're not very English. They're they're almost more New Zealand in style. I find, and that's that's definitely not a bad thing. Um, but uh, but they're they're definitely improving. Um, but I think the Simpsons is on sale at the moment online. And I, I encourage people to give it a go. I think it's really very nice. Uh, we also do Black Book every now and again. Um, so it's made in London, but the grapes come from Essex, Crouch Valley typically. And they're very exciting as well. And then we've got anyone in El anyone else in Essex and any views on Charles Palmer? I don't think I know Charles Palmer. Sorry. No, I don't. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, I don't know Charles Palmer. It'll be happily one that I, I, I look up and maybe uh, maybe have a look at on, on the um, on the Hansel wine. Roger's got, got a comment here. Brilliant wine. The difficulty I have is that at sixty pounds, would I prefer a Cote d'Or or example? Um, that's a very difficult decision, and I may not be brave enough to bypass the Burgundy option, which he calls yeah. the real thing. <laughs> yeah, you're absolutely right. Yeah, I, it, it's it's it's. <laughs> It's a nice problem to have, I think. <laughs> um, I think if, if you're if you're looking for something, you know, six years old now with some development, with a bit of oomph and real kind of super class, then I think this this ticks the box. I think, but at the same time, you, you're getting really great wine still in Burgundy at sixty quid a bottle. Um, it's I suppose it's just a style thing. Maybe grab a mate. They buy one, you buy the other, and then you join up and <laughs> drink both side by side. That's that's probably what I would do. I think someone's just thrown in another English producer, Flinton Shotley in Suffolk and Norfolk. I don't know if you know them either. Flint, yeah, I know Flint. I've tried their wines a while ago. I think they're very good. Find them a bit expensive, personally, uh, and Shotley I know of, but I haven't tried recently. So I will, I will, I will take a look. Uh, why are Pinot Noir wines so expensive? Is it because they are intrinsically expensive to make, or are they priced at what the market will accept, or a bit of both? Great question. Pinot Noir is difficult to make. It is. It is a very temperamental grape variety. Uh, it's difficult to get right. Um, tannins are an issue um, getting proper ripeness is difficult without getting rot 
And so it is intrinsically a very difficult grape to grow. I mentioned earlier that there's a very fine line in terms of getting optimal ripeness. But at the same time, I'm sure there is a an intrinsic expectation of price with a lot of Pinot. Um, and so I'm sure people do put their Pinot Noir at a price that they think it's supposed to be, rather than necessarily what the wine is. But the good ones are really bloody good. And that's, you know, that's our job. That's our job as buyers is to tell you guys what we think is is worth it and to separate the wheat from the chaff and and to, to help you all make hopefully the right decisions um so yeah if uh yeah that davenport i know davenport yeah they're very good um difference between sonoma and napa yeah you're not going to find much pinot in napa um napa is pretty hot it's cabernet sauvignon country really and then if you go further up there's quite a lot of um zinfandel as well it's very hot um and so if expect big bold cabernets at eye-watering prices a lot of the time any oregon favorites i mean um uh what are they called uh i'm gonna have to bloody look it up lemelson lemelson are great and i really do think their wines have that ruddy rusty nail character in the nicest way possible um and they're deep and dense um which is very good. I'm trying to see if you were buying a bottle of Pinot Noir as a gift, which bottle would you buy? Depends on your budget. <laughs> if you're buying it for me, then, uh, you know, Rumier, Rousseau, anything like that would, would do the trick perfectly well. Uh, thank you. Your views on Romanian Pinot Noir, uh, they can be very nice, nice and affordable. Uh, we have a constant battle, me and Freddie. Freddie buys Romanian wine and I buy Hungarian wine. Um, of who can get the best affordable Pinot. Um, and I think at the moment we have it with the Osteros Pinot because it basically we, we love finding affordable Pinot from Eastern Europe that's got genuine Pinot Noir character and it's hard, but I think that we do some, we do have some very good Romanian and, and Hungarian Pinot that has genuine character and are honest wines. Um, Elk Cove, yeah. Yeah, yeah, they're, they're lovely wines. They've got a wonderful Pinot Blanc as well. Their Pinot Blanc is really nice. I think they do a good Riesling as well. Maybe a good Pinot Gris. Yeah, very nice. Um, yeah, what else? Expedition wine number two, by far the best value for money. Totally agree. That is really nice. Really nice. If, if I was to hang my hat on which one to buy, you know, I, I would probably be walking into the showroom tomorrow at Stevenage and I would probably be going for a bottle of the, the Pinot. I think it's really good. Um, that or the... Uh, what wines have we tasted? Um, maybe the maybe the Dr. Edge as well, but to, to tuck away for a couple of years because I think that's super nice. Um, I think people saying that the German wine they were so keen on for me this is these this probably got the roughest tannins um, they're quite gravelly um, yeah um, yeah quite drying on the finish have you tasted the exhibition Sonoma um, Pinot Noir I know we're out of stock at the moment and we're waiting on a new vintage but thoughts on that one yeah delicious um who i think is it shug that make it mahesh do you think? I, i'm not sure man I, and it's not I'll, I'll try and find a link online but no I've, I've got it here now cool yeah it's shug uh it's outrageous value i mean to have a sonoma coast pinot from a producer like shug for under 15 squid is crazy good i think there's a little bit of american oak in it as well if my memory serves me rightly from tasting it, um, which gives a nice um, American feel, which is good. 13.8% alcohol, so a little bit warmer. It's great. As soon as it's back in stock, I definitely recommend uh, getting a bottle of it because it is it's crazy good value. We've had a lot of New World exhibition wines come out recently, which I just think are insane value. And I would say that because I work for the Wine Society, but... I don't buy any of them, apart from the exhibitions in America. Um, but some of the 
Aussie Chardonnays that we've got and the Santa Barbara Chardonnay that is that's America in a glass it's delicious um we, we have got a couple of positive comments on the German Pinot Noir Peter yeah. Cousins thought it was the best and Roger and Jean thought it was lovely yeah um, I, I like Richard, it as well yeah Richard wants you to talk on tannins powdery gravelly etc you're the man <laughs> I'm the man I definitely find that the German for me is the is quite gravelly tannins they're a little bit drying, but I think that's just quite an old world thing. I know we shouldn't really be saying old world, new world anymore, but it's just the easiest way of different, differentiating at the moment. They are structured. They're quite chewy, quite gravelly. They're definitely, yeah, a, a, a key element in the wine. I've just tried the Newton Johnson. For me, they are super plush, very sweet, very soft very velvety um they're almost they're almost hardly there um they're very velvety which is nice um i'm running out of i stopped i stopped spitting i have a little bit of the chili and just to remind myself these these tasting packs if anyone hasn't seen them but you get them in these kind of little boxes with a little bag inside and they do work brilliantly well well, I did spill half the German Pinot down my trousers to start with, which isn't ideal. So I suggest using scissors rather than your teeth, which is what I did. Uh, right, this is the Chilean. Definitely grippier than the um, Newton Johnson, I find. Um, they're quite prickly. And they're kind of like little little pin stabs I find on my on kind of on the top of my lip, and they kind of grow, they really build, um, which is which is nice uh, structure. But yeah, prickly tannins I would say. This is fun. I love talking about tannins. This is great. Uh, what wine is this? I'm losing count. This is the Doctor Edge. While you're doing that, Jim and Karen, fab tasting. Thank you. Love the German Pinot. They were all good. Nice selection. Uh, thanks, Matthew. For value, the TWS exhibition uh, from Lamari was excellent. Totally agree. Yeah, Toby's done a brilliant job with that. Um, I, I would say the Dr. Reg tannins are quite powdery. Is that what we were talking about earlier? Is that the wine that we were talking about earlier? Yes, it was, I believe. Sorry. <laughs> Whoever said powdery, well done. Yeah, I think I think you're absolutely spot on. They're definitely powdery. powdery. They really coat your mouth. Um, what is this? This is the Prophet's Rock. Yeah, chunky, grippy, slightly drying. They're quite, they're, they're bigger, blockier. Anyway, it's probably enough about tannins now, isn't it? Um, <laughs> any other questions? I hope you've all had a good time. I've had a great time. More tasting packs, please. I totally agree. We should do this more and more and more. The great thing is, is that now that the now the technology is there, and we're really super confident that it does keep the wines really well. I think I think there will be more um, because I, I I love doing them, um, and I would like to do more because it's good fun. Any other questions? I've got one more just come in from Roger and Jean. How do we get a percentage reduction on these wines? <laughs> I, I believe that that will be on Catherine's follow-up email, won't it? Tomorrow? Yeah, so you'll get, a, a from what Catherine mentioned earlier, you'll get an email probably tomorrow, or certainly I expect tomorrow, a follow-up email saying, you know, thank you for attending. And there'll be a code on that email, which if you go online and purchase any of these wines, I think on the checkout, if you put in that code, it should deduct. 10%. And then uh, your favourite Burgundy and from the Wine Society and non-Wine Society wines, if you if you buy outside the Wine Society. And also we've had a quick food and match. The questions are still flying in now, really. So Good. Um, was the Burgundy one that I could actually afford or is it? <laughs> it uh, doesn't say, so I'll leave that to you. <laughs> The, the greatest wine I've ever tried in my life was 2017 Rumier Amoureuse 
from from barrel it was it blew my mind how good it was uh it was the greatest tasting experience of my life tasting at rumier it's unbelievable in terms of stuff that i might one day actually be able to afford um the oh no, I, I was like oh this wine it's 105 pounds a bottle um i for, for me the the contamant Claude de Zepineau Monopole from in, in Pomard is is a great wine. And yes, it's £105 a bottle, but it's really nice. It's, it's some some quick food food matches for yeah. tonight. Uh duck is always a great one with Burgundy, I find. Um any meaty perhaps with a little kind of red red sauce whether that be a light kind of raspberry-esque sauce would be quite nice uh anything with a little bit of fat but not too much um uh, but yeah those kind of ducky geesey wines with where that acid can really cut through nicely would work really well i think um yeah i'm i'm really not very good at food and wine matching i must admit i tend to just drink and eat whatever i fancy um but yeah those things yeah, we've, we've had uh, mushrooms lamb and red currant as well attractive. mushrooms of course definitely mushrooms with old old pinot truffles uh you name it why don't we do this all in person at the wine society a pinot and truffle dinner how about that with with mushrooms and lee was tasting all these wines with the mushroom risotto and it worked really well i mean that sounds great I don't know what my wife is cooking, but I hope it's mushroom risotto. Something tells me it's not going to be that, but, but who knows? Um, but yeah, thank you, everybody. And thank you, Mahesh. I know you've got the wines as well, and I believe you'll taste them tomorrow. So let me know what you think. I'll watch it all back on YouTube tomorrow. Good man. If, you, if, you, if you're a brave man to do this twice. <laughs> is he gone? Who knows? No, I'm, I'm still here. Just Very good. Thank you, everybody. I'm going to go and uh, finish off my burgundy, um, not my burgundy, um, my pinot samples, and uh, and have some din dins. So uh, yeah, I think I think I don't think I'm down to do another tasting for a while, but uh, it's nice chatting to you all again. Thanks, Matthew. It's a great evening. Ciao, ciao. Bye.